At the far end, we have uh, Mr. Rupa Dragomici, he's the president of uh, Holy Ascension Church in Ecars. Nazi 
One people, yet unarmed, rose to defy the mighty war machine of the Axis. On May 8, 1941, a soldier of the people called the people to bear arms against the invader. He was Colonel Dragunov Mihailovich. His message of hope was heard around the world. I can speak from my birthplace, America, which was overwhelmed with admiration and joy that the human spirit was alive and well in the mountains and hills of Serbia. America could, do, could not do enough for the Serbians. There was love, generosity, and respect for the Serbs everywhere. General Eisenhower, commander of all Allied forces, called Raja Mihailović the first fighter and guerrilla of Europe. It was with these thoughts in mind that I was asked to join a military unit, the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, that would help Draja and his fighters to coordinate the evacuation of American airmen. In July of 1944, my big moment came. I was chosen to go into Planini, Yugoslavia, to join, to join Captain George Mussolini, Mike Rajic, E. Radio Operator Arthur Jubilian, when you be our minas Americanas, to join the Haggard Mission. Our task was to evacuate hundreds of American airmen and allies who had been saved by the Serbian Narod, Serbian people, and Serbian Chetniks of Draža Mihailović. These American airmen, about the age of 25 or less, had taken off from Italy with cargoes of bombs. They flew to Polesti, also to Vienna, by the way, <laughs> producing the main targets an oil producing center in Romania, which was very heavily defended by the Germans. For days, the skies were full of planes, and many were destroyed or damaged. As they returned to their base, many faltered. They lost speed. As they returned, lost speed, and many were destroyed and damaged. As they returned to their base, many faltered, lost speed, and the crews were forced to parachute to the ground. General Mihailovich gave orders that every American and Allied airman was to be protected, fed, and cared for. To this day, these airmen cannot forget the way the poor peasants in the villages and mountains of Serbia and Bosnia fed them, clothed, and cared for them. They moved out of their homes to produce beds. They themselves would live inside the barns, na slamu, in Napolia. What food they had, they shared, making certain that these young American airmen were well taken care of, as if they were part of their own family. When German patrols arrived, Looking for the Americans, the Serbian peasants moved the airmen, hiding them in the woods, always ready to give their lives for their guests. Quickly and expeditiously, under the supervision of Major Zvonko Vučković, commander of the 1st Ravnagora Corpus, the peasants and Chetniks constructed a temporary airstrip at Pranjeni. On August 9th, at 10 o'clock in, in the evening, 1944, four C-47s, transport planes, which is the military version of DC-3s, landed. We immediately loaded 12 American airmen to each plane. That night, all 48 American airmen were returned safely to Bari, Italy. On the 10th of August, 1944, 
at 8.45 in the morning, six C-47s landed. We loaded 20 airmen to each plane. Remembering that in the daylight, you could load 20 airmen, but at night you could only load about 14. The whole procedure, whole process was repeated at about 9.30 in the morning. 20 more airmen were loaded to each plane. All 240 airmen were returned safely to Bari, Italy. During the daylight evacuations, the 10th of August, we had security cover of 25 P-51s, fighter planes, protecting our evacuation. In addition, I repeat, approximately 8,000 techniques under the command of Colonel Aza Milosevic protected the outlying areas of Ravnagora and the Pranini airstrip. The P-51s buzzed the vicinity of Gordy Milanovic, Chacha, Kraljevo, and other nearby German-occupied strongholds. The people, the peasants, Narus, were straining their eyes upward, disbelief on their faces. They cheered, they waved, they pounded each other on their backs, so full of emotion. That was the greatest show on earth. What a show put on by our American Air Force. These hundreds of Serbian peasants had rushed the field Serbia rushed the field to say goodbye to the flyers. Flowers were strewn, strewn all over the airfield. The airmen, in turn, were throwing out their clothing, jackets, shoes, whatever they had that they could get rid of. The people were crying. I was by far one of the greatest thrills in my life. On September 6, 1944, it was King Peter's birthday. Trial Petar Rodinan. Proslava Upranini. People all dressed up, cleaning everything. All of them were carrying flowers. Crowds in town, getting bigger by the hour. Captain Kalovich, old Chikapero on hand, with his thousands of Chetniks. A motley crew, barefooted, naked almost, and many without guns. But what a morale. Our OSS photographer, J.B. Allen, was taking pictures. Chicha, Draja, and Colonel McDowell arrived about 10.30 to be buried under flowers. People were crying. They were so happy. After the troop review and church services, we went out to Popovich's Polya to eat, drink, and listen to Chita's speech. What a terrific day. By the way, I sat across from Chica Pedro Kalabich, and we were eating there, and he looked over at me and he says, Lalichu, Vidisho Kamus, to Yede Yagne, to Takum Kaje, Tosse Gobori. I agreed. I said, yes, that's like a gun, you know. That was his weapon. <laughs> On September 10th, 1944, we were headed for Kutsanyo, our next airstrip that was to be built. We got wind this afternoon to get ready to move from Panyana in case the partisans break through. From the Malyan Planina mountain, we decided to hide all of our landing equipment, lamps, etc., and leave Panyana. Because our fires were injured, we put them on horses. We struck out on foot, Pieske. Partisans came around on our left flank of the Chetniks, left flank of the Chetniks, and started to push on for our positions. So we kept moving, went on to Raichi, then decided to push on over the Suibor mountain and over the Suiborski pool. Remember the Mayan Planina and Suibor are sort of together in line. A real grind, and on into Mionitsa. So in Mionitsa, Medju, Valjevo, Ilazarovic, Ilazarovic. All this while, Chikapero was protecting General Halovich's flank and rear guard. At Kotsenyo, at the airdrome, we evacuated 25 airmen. 25 airmen. 
Dr. Matrani and his two aides, Colonel Dr. Carpenter, and our OSS photographer, J.B. Allen. It was a daylight evacuation with two DC-3s with cover above a 50 P-51s, fighter planes. The rescue of American airmen continued, went on for approximately three more months, from Planine to Kotsevo in Matshva, across the Drina River, at Badovici over to Bosna. After the crossing of the Drina at Badovinci under extreme hardships, it was raining very heavily and difficult to cross into Bosna. We finally moved into Djeline. We crossed the north, we crossed northwestern Bosna onto the Trelala Mountains, meeting with the famous Czechic warrior Pope Sava. From the Trelova Mountains, we moved south along the Bosna River to Osechani and Subske Grabske. Remembering, we had American airmen with us as we went along. We would collect them here, there, and everywhere. We then moved on to near Doboy. Well, Doboy, we looked down from the mountaintop. We could look down at the German stronghold in Doboy. We then moved south along the Splecha River. We crossed at Boyanich, where we built another airstrip. We then crossed the Oslan Mountains and down to a village of Okrudlice, not too far from Sarajevo, Draja's new headquarters. Before reaching Okrudlice, Colonel Vodal, the Ranger mission, the intelligence mission, was recalled back to Bali, Italy with Captain John Milodragovic from Montana, American, Milko Rajic from Minnesota, and radio operator Mike Dibiak, Serbian boy, Navy, from Gary, Indiana. Plus nine American airmen, they evacuated at Boyanich airstrip on November 1, 1944. Lalic was told to stay on and pick up 16 more airmen who were held up at Visegrad. Instead, the airmen were brought to a crew, he said. Later, during early December, about that time, the Halyard mission was recalled, that is, our mission was recalled to Barry Italy. They were recalling the 16 airmen, plus we also knew at that time there were nine more airmen held up at Voyanich. Our man is here tonight who was evacuated that day, later. They proposed three possible ways of getting out. One was to go across the Bosna Rijeka and go on to Bulgogna. Number two, they wanted us to travel to Sanjak and down to Ternagora and down to the sea and then come across the Adriatic. Number three, they told me, they suggested this. They said, take your 16 airmen and go across the mountains and pick up your nine more airmen. That'd be 25 airmen together. And then have the Raja and his Chetniks arrange to have us put in the hands of the partisans. <laughs> well, <laughs> Raja saw this Depushed, his, his message, and he asked me, what do you think? I said, Nikako. <laughs> Nikako. <laughs> I'll keep my airmen together until they come and get me, which happened. And I wrote him back a long, long message and told him the condition of our American flyers and what stage we were in. And at the very end, I gave him hell. I says, Koni su lutin anas, mi yedem ozov, a koni nemo nishto Yeah. Oh, I should say that in English, yeah. The, the, this message I wrote back to headquarters to George Winovich. I said, George, the horses are mad at us. We're eating all their oats, and they haven't got no food. <laughs> well, anyhow, they wrote back and says, okay, Lalich, you go like you suggest, and we'll come and get you sooner or later. 
I lived with Raja Mahalovic for over five months. He was a man of down-to-earth simplicity, symbol of the simple, sturdy Serbian peasant resistance to tyranny, foreign and domestic. He believed and loved his church. Draža je uvijek nosio posiljak on his right jacket pocket. That in America is basil. It's our church flower and blessing homes. What it's up. He loved his soldiers and, and, and shared their hardships. He was truly a great man. His honesty, integrity, and straightforwardness. His techniques treated the American airmen like free men and allies. Draja had no political ambitions. All he wanted was a fair shake in a down-to-earth election. That was his basis for his Ravnagora Pokret. Vote for your king or vote for whomever else you desire. More so, he wanted a little touch of America in his own land. Remember also that in 1941 he got together with the opposition, the communists. An understanding to cooperate was in the offering by Draja, but it was evident that the communist doctrine was not was that they would not accept. Draja had no propaganda machine at that time, not until late 1944, and then it was too late. Draja told me that in his estimation, the two greatest Americans were Thomas Jefferson, who was the architect of our Constitution, and Abraham Lincoln, who with heavy heart fought to preserve the Union. Draja was a soldier who loved his people, who loved his native land. Before leaving Draja, I told him that I had a deputy in my hand, that the OSF headquarters had got permission from our American government via George Winovich in Bari Italy, to bring Draja out of Yugoslavia if he cared to leave. He said to me, Lalichu, I will stay and share the faith of my people, whatever that may be. My people. Moya Zemlya, my land. I will stay to the end. Unquote Raja. We left Raja Mihailovic on the 11th of December 1944 with our American flyers. That was the 16 flyers I had on hand. From the village of Kruglice, not too far from Sarajevo, Varesh, Ovo, Svedne, Ihans Gesak. There in the pre-morning dawn, during a heavy snowfall, Draja assembled his 2,000 Chetniks for a farewell salute to the 16 American flyers of the Halyard Mission. Right there in the middle. Leaving Draja's Ramagora fighters. There in front of his troops, we kissed Draja goodbye. Yes, the American airmen, as well as Jimmy, my radio operator, and I. The Uspomen. Draza Mihailovic presented to me a kama, a two-edged Serbian knife. Also a kama for Captain George Vujnovic, the OSS operations chief in Bari. Draza then had his sergeant tear off the patch of his jacket on the left shoulder, which he had worn for four years, and gave it to me. On it was written, Samosloga Srbina Spasava. to survive. In turn, I had to give Draja something. I gave Draja my American carbine, the strap of which I put over his head on his shoulder. He says, Suzama, I kissed him three puta i rekaos bogom i fala za sve. To je bil jedan žalstan odlazak. Very sad departure. We parted our 16 airmen, Jimmy and I, waving to Draja Mihailovic, the Chetnik rifles salute us long into the morning. For our trip back to Boyanich, Bosna airstrip near Doboy, Draja gave us 40 Chetniks, led by Sharne, 
who at that time was the champion skier of, US, of Serbia, who knew the snow and who not across mountains. Also, Major Blagojevic as my liaison officer, and two blind Serbian officers who Zaja asked me as a favor to take back with us to Barry Italy, which I consented yes, and they were with us. One was Major Bogicevic, and the other was Colonel Sevancinin. We slowly took off for the Zvezda Planina, over to Stog, across the Krivaya Rijeka, across the Oslin Mountains, stopping for church services at the monastery, and on to Boyanich. There were nine more American airmen waiting for us. On Christmas of 1944, <laughs> Christmas tree. So they went out to buy a Christmas tree or found it someplace, not buy it, and they they filled it up with flak, I believe it's called. Yeah. And they they were no bello, like uh, not only annoying, but uh, aluminum, and they filled the Christmas tree with that, and we all sat down, including our wonderful lieutenant here, and uh, we sat down, started to drink, and having a real good time. He mouthed me, Pebble, he meant it's not your best man. And suddenly, it was bitter cold outside, and suddenly we got word that there was a B-25 coming to drop supplies. That is Rane, or Delo, and you know, everything else, but no guns. And so we all dashed out of the airfield, it was bitter cold, and we put out our signals and got ready for them. But anyhow, <laughs> we heard the plane, and it was a B-25, and it was Mugrabil, you know, fog was up high, and we wondered if that plane could get closer to the ground, and all of a sudden, and here was the blue sky, and the plane come right down through, and he circled around, and, ever, and he started to drop these big canisters. And the canisters dropped four or five of them, and we all ran out to get them, and one was broke, it, it, it split open. And I remember seeing a number 10 can, a big can, and we looked closer, and it was, it was uh, peanut butter. <laughs> Masla or Kikiriki, sir. <laughs> and we just got the biggest get. We picked everything up, went back for our Hayat, and that was Christmas, 1944, December 25th. Then on the 27th of December, two C-47s landed on our airstrip along the Spreccia River. Evacuated was 25 airmen, two Serbian blind officers, Bobby Mayanovich from Alakupa, Pennsylvania. My radio operator evacuated on that same day was our wonderful man who is here today with, with us, our own Lieutenant Marvin Stoloff. Yeah. 
shot by a firing squad in Belgrade after the trial. I would like to relate to you people two items of importance. Number one, a message that was sent to the Allies from Draja Mihailovic in 1944, and, and number two, Draja's last words and sentences of his speech at the close of his trial in Belgrade in 1946. First, the message. The army and Serbian people are naked, barefoot, and hungry. Unless help is given, all the Serbs will perish. In what way do the innocent Serbian people sin against God and against their allies that they should be so punished? Is there nowhere a friend who will raise his voice? The Serbs would rather perish than submit to a communist command or embrace communism. Number two, the last words at the trial in Belgrade, the last sentences of his speech, which were so honest, so wise, and so mild. Draza said, I wanted nothing for myself. I never wanted the old Yugoslavia, but I, had, but I had a difficult legacy. I had against me a cooperative, competitive organization, a party which seeks its, seeks its aims without compromise. I believe I was on the right road and called on my foreign journalist or Red Army mission to visit me and see everything. But faith was merciless to me when it threw me into this turmoil and whirlpool. I wanted much. I started much. But the guilt of the world carried away me and my work. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. This man, Mihailovich, was a good man. And like all of us Serbians here today, we are all loyal to him. We take the side of God, good against evil. Slava Cici. Next we'll have another honored guest here this evening. Mr. Marvin Stoloff. Just a brief uh, biography here on Mr. Stoloff. He was a lieutenant in the U.S. Army Air Corps, which eventually became the Air Force. He's a native of New Jersey, but he now resides in Michigan. And he operates a business there with his wife, Bethel. He's attending with his son and daughter-in-law and friends this evening. He was shot down during World War II after a bombing raid over Vienna. And he will now share his uh, story with us.
and that's a dangerous altitude without oxygen. So he got us down to about 17,000 feet by easing back on the throttles. The nose would go down, the corbin into a dive, he shoved the throttles forward because he had no elevator to maintain an attitude, if you understand anything about flying. And he was able to maintain flight for an hour until we got over Yugoslavia. At that point, because of the gas leak in the engines, two of the engines were out on one side, and because he had no rudder, we couldn't counteract the dead engine, so the plane started to wind up. And he called for uh, time to bail out. I was 20 years old, you know, and wars are fought mostly by young people. And the reason they are is because young people are immortal. And it's never going to happen to them until it does. And when he said it was time to bail out, I looked down that 15,000 feet out of the bottom bay and said, not me. <laughs> and, uh, but then when I saw the pilot climbing out of his seat, I guess I had no choice. And uh, I just, uh, one of the things you always learn is you be caught on the ground without your shoes. But we flew in the plane with these fleece lined boots and we had our shoes on the side. So I tied the shoes to my harness and tumbled out of the plane. And the slipstream caught those shoes and just ripped them off the harness. I went reaching for them while I'm tumbling through the air. I never did catch them. At any rate, uh, at five mi uh, yeah, three miles up, uh, I pulled the string. Nothing happened. I lift up the flap and start yanking, and the chute pops. And then you feel a real strong jerk. That's where the filling of the chute takes place, and you stop free falling. And then I don't know if ever there is such a thing as heaven. That's it. I was slightly anoxic, which is like a cheap drunk because of lack of oxygen. But I was singing away. I felt so good looking at that dude up there. But also at that altitude, there's no apparent motion. There is no sound. There is like complete stillness. If you can visualize what heaven might be, this is it. Because you are, the air is your environment. So there's no wind. There could be a 100 mile an hour wind, but there's no wind because you were part of it. And uh, I saw a chute nearby and I called to it. It was one of my fellow crewmen, and I recognized who it was by his southern accent. It was Franz Holscher. And uh, we sort of talked to each other on the way down. And there's no sense of falling because you're so far from the earth that you feel like you're floating. It's only the last thousand feet that you see the earth starting to come up at you. And I saw myself heading to a batch of trees. And I didn't want to be speared on a tree, so I pulled one side. They taught you in class that if you spilled the chute, it would change your direction somewhat. So I spilled the chute, and I started plummeting. I said, I'll take my chance with the trees. <laughs> and I did land in them, but in between, I was lucky. Uh, and within a few minutes after I landed, I was surrounded by people I didn't know that had these insignia on that look, almost looked like a skull and crossbones. They looked very fierce, with ammunition strung across their shoulders, just like you envision guerrillas uh, fighting a war. And we had been briefed over the months I had been in Italy that if you had to bail out, you were to avoid the uh, Croatian Yusati, and the Chetniks, you were tr trying to get with Tito's partisans, if you could. So when we were first surrounded by these, this group of men, we tried to identify ourselves. You're Americanski, they call it Russian, and, and, and so we call ourselves Americano, Americanski, whatever. They recognized, we pointed to the flags in our uniforms, and as soon as they recognized who we were, we were immediately accepted and treated well. 
Uh, as I say, uh, one fellow proven, Ron Colt, who was just a short distance from him, so we went together and we were together immediately. And they took us, I forget all the specifics, this is like 51 years ago, and I haven't been playing this story that many times in those years, so my recollection may not be that clear. But we were taken uh, a short distance to a farmhouse, and maybe two other members of the crew came along, and then we traveled by car. I had to get in the car because I didn't have my shoes. <laughs> so I could walk that easily in flight boots. And uh, at any rate, it took us about over a period of two or three days. They brought all the crew together except for the pilot. I learned afterwards that the pilot had gone through the plane after everybody had bailed out to make sure everybody was out. Uh, and therefore he landed further away than the rest of us did. And so eight of us out of the nine from the crew were together within a couple of days, and then he came along about the third or fourth day. And then we traveled, I don't know the locations of all these places, but we traveled to this farmhouse in the hills near Delroy, and they wanted to separate us, but we decided we wanted to stay together, and we all stayed in this one room farmhouse, slept on straw bed, and we stayed there for that 40 days. Uh, I forget how long it was before the 40 days were up. Maybe after 30, we heard about Nick and his radio man, and they came along, and they were in contact with it. And Nick fought the battle, the good battle as he described, where they wanted us to travel over the mountains to the partisans and let them take us out, and he insisted no. So I'm confirming what he said. Uh, Everything is true. I mean, uh, this is what happened. We had a couple of wounded men. I think some of the other airmen were fighter pilots, and they were hurt. And it just couldn't be done. And he didn't sit, and we did fly out. And uh, that's the story of the trip. Everybody treated us well. We didn't have any great luxuries. I lived on boiled cabbage for most of the 40 days. Some gold milk and, gold milk and black bread for breakfast and boiled cabbage for dinner. And I lost about 40 to 20 pounds, 25 pounds. But I actually got back after 41 days, and I flew again. I just realized afterwards, I just read something, that I'm in a catch-22 situation. If you were MIA for 42 days, which is six weeks, you didn't have to buy it. I was MIA for 41 days. So, while I was shot down on my 27th mission, you're supposed to fly 35, I ended up flying those 35. I went back and completed my tour. Getting back, going back a little bit, when we landed in Barry, and whenever any of these things happen here, you're debriefed by some intelligence officers, and we want to tell them about our treatment by Shetniks, they didn't want to hear. They didn't want anything. They didn't want to know anything about our treatment by the Shetniks. And uh, it couldn't have been better. And I still thank them to this day. That's why I'm here.